Registered Phenomena Code 394 Object Class Alpha Orange Hazard Types Psychotronic Hazard Sapient Hazard Organic Hazard Destabilization Hazard Tychokinetic Hazard Grouped Hazard Ideological Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-394 is currently contained at Site-002 in a standard item containment chamber, sealed within a 4x4 oblong vein of anomalously affected, semi-transparent silver ore which cannot be damaged by any conventional means. Testing on RPC-394 or access to its containment chamber is restricted behind Level 4 or higher approval. RPC-394 requires no maintenance. However, cameras are to be remotely inspected per standard remote upkeep protocols. Once a month, Site-286 staff are to be deployed to the location of RPC-394's holding. Upon arrival, they are to ensure the continuous sustainability of its containment systems, repairing or updating them if necessary. Special care must be put towards the protocols regarding its memetic properties. Upon completion, staff are to enact a one-week observation of the anomaly, ensuring no unorthodox changes occur, and departing once this period ends. Description: RPC-394 is an autonomously beating human heart, estimated to be more than 2,000 years of age. The exterior of RPC-394 retains the coloration normally attributed to a healthy human heart, despite lacking any detectable blood cells. RPC-394's main anomalous feature, referred to as RPC-394-1, is its ability to warp reality to a degree that is commonly associated with the granting of magical wishes. However, instances of RPC-394-1 have always been recorded to cause, either directly or indirectly, harmful and or lethal effects, subsequent to the granting of the wish upon the user of RPC-394. With a large majority of RPC-394-1 users suffering what is typically seen as betrayal from their family or known acquaintances. Its secondary effect, designated RPC-394-2, is the gradual shift of a person's ideological and moral standards towards those that can be considered as greedy and or envious in nature, with prolonged exposure exacerbating the psychological degradation to the point of disregarding any and all preconceived moral convictions, familial bonds, etc. Greedy being defined as the desire for material and or societal power, regardless of its consequences and means of obtainment. These changes can be mentally mitigated through use of mental dampeners and or one's own mental fortitude during short periods of exposure to RPC-394. However, they may become permanent depending on the time within close proximity to RPC-394, as well as one's pre-existing behavioral patterns prior to exposure. RPC-394 has the ability to telepathically communicate with all sapient beings within a 4x4-meter range of it. 12B in Imperial Standards Personnel have reported RPC-394 communicating to them when entering this range, with each individual that hears RPC-394 regarding its voice. This voice strengthens in both psychotronic strength and clarity as one gets closer to RPC-394. Subjects that communicate with RPC-394 in this manner will first perceive it as weak, increasing in volume as time passes. The voice will begin vocalizing in Aramaic, slowly shifting to the English vocabulary as contact is maintained, speaking in fluid English by the end. With said clarity, transitioning, depending on the listener's native language, the amount of time exposed to RPC-394's influence, and the distance from it. During telepathic communication, RPC-394 will refer to itself as Judas of Karioth or Sir Judas Iscariot of Karioth, firmly believing itself as the original Judas mentioned in the biblical story of Jesus Christ's betrayal, Karioth being a local village south of Judea, referenced in the Bible, Amos 2-2. When questioned about its name 
and or origin. RPC-394 will roughly paraphrase Judas' story, as told in the Bible, with the key difference being that he had been given three separate curses by what RPC-394 believes to be the Judaic God, sometime after Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Born south of Judea, Judas had been a normal citizen of the Roman Empire at the time, until he met a man capable of performing miracles. This man would later be outlawed by the Romans, and Judas, unbeknownst to Jesus' fate, would betray him for thirty pieces of silver. Learning of Jesus Christ's crucifixion and feeling reluctant, Judas would attempt to return the money, only for it to be rejected. Later on in his life, Judas would purchase the field in which Jesus Christ was crucified in. Around thirty to thirty-three years following Jesus Christ's death, Judas would be hanged in said field. The first curse was being granted with the same reality-altering abilities Jesus Christ allegedly once possessed, the second being misfortune for all those who may ask for miracles to be granted by RPC-394, and the third being immortality, so that, in RPC-394's own words, may the shadow of my betrayal be forever cast upon humanity, a constant reminder of man's greed and desire. According to RPC-394, all that supposedly remains of its body is the heart that we see today. Discovery RPC-394 was discovered on January 24, 2020, following reports of anomalous activity at Mount Vesuvius, Italy. After several MST units were sent in to investigate the recently discovered crypt within Mount Vesuvius, Various anomalous items of interest were recovered, and numerous persons of interest were detained. RPC-394 was discovered within the lowermost chamber of the crypt, surrounded by multiple individuals reciting Roman Catholic chants or hymns. RPC-394's main anomalous abilities were discovered when Authority personnel attempted to secure RPC-394, only to unexpectedly hear Hebrew spoken telepathically to them. RPC-394's reality-warping abilities were noted when Private Hudson of MST Alpha-3 Scavengers, jokingly suggested, I wish I was back in the Bahamas instead of this shithole. After hearing RPC-394 attempting to explain with his lack of comprehension for the English language at the time what it was doing within Mount Vesuvius, and how it had become sealed within the ore it was in upon capture. Said request was granted by RPC-394, as Private Hudson was nearly instantly relocated to Nassau. RPC-394's secondary side effect was also simultaneously discovered when Private Hudson appeared in front of an individual that he had supposedly swindled during a previous visit five years prior. Contact was soon lost with MST Alpha-3, as the effect of RPC-394-2 had manifested in the remaining operatives, who had all allegedly deactivated their radios within seconds of each other. It is then assumed that each MST operative in the presence of RPC-394 had begun to engage each other in close quarters combat, likely to be the only one able to make use of RPC-394's reality-bending properties. When a separate MST unit, MST Uniform-01, was sent in to investigate, after an hour of complete radio silence, they discovered that all the operatives had been severely cut, bruised, or were in various degrees of both consciousness and rationality based on their position relative to the RPC-394. RPC-394 was later recovered when a section of the entrance to Mount Vesuvius was cut open, and RPC-394 was carefully loaded onto a remotely operated automobile which was eventually transported to Site-002 for proper containment. Document. Interviews with RPC-394 Post-containment interview with RPC-394 Interviewed RPC-394 Interviewer Researcher Jonathan Crisp Forward. On January 25, RPC-394 had been safely secured at Site-002. Researcher Crisp being the expert dealing with mental-based anomalies at Site-002, is asked to be the first one to interview RPC-394. Several minutes are taken beforehand 
for RPC-394 to adjust to Researcher Chris' mind, as well as multiple minute breaks in between, to mitigate the effects of RPC-394's ideological hazards. The interview takes place within RPC-394's containment chamber. The interview is 4 minutes and 48 seconds long, as even with Researcher Chris' above average mental fortitude, as well as a mental dampener equipped, 5 minutes is all that can be withstood. Begin Log 11.37 AM Eastern Standard Time Good afternoon, RPC-394. I hope you are ready to begin our interview. Why do you refer to me as such? I am not offended by this title of yours, but it is most perplexing. It is merely a precaution we take here at the Authority. Have you accommodated well to your surroundings, RPC-394? Indecipherable communication outside the containment chamber. Yes, yes, I get it. I'll get on with it. My apologies, RPC-394, but my superiors disagree on any formalities and simply wish to begin with the questioning. If you don't mind, I'd like to begin by asking you a simple enough question. Are you still capable of viewing your surroundings? RPC-394 pauses briefly before continuing. Yes, but it is not through normal eyesight. It is more of a gut instinct. It helps to view through the eyes of those near me. It is how I can tell I am no longer within my chamber of damnation. I see through your eyes as we speak, Sir Crisp. But you needn't worry. I have not the ability to peer further into your mind. I understand being in my presence has a negative influence on you, and I wish to make this conversation easy on you, my friend. Friend? We've only just met. Compared to my previous circumstances and my past crimes, this treatment is far too kind for one such as myself. I have made kings forget the importance of their crowns. Kind-hearted fathers become cold-hearted murderers. Well, thank you, RPC-394. I can assure you we deal with far worse things here. Now then, how would you describe your time within Mount Vesuvius? Maddening. The Italians had discovered my still-beating heart during what your mind refers to as the Renaissance Era. The Octoritas, bless their hearts, had offered to end my suffering, but they were unable to end me. A sect of putrid filth had collected me, saying I had no right to die. RPC-394 pauses briefly. Perhaps they are right. I had betrayed God. But this does not mean I don't still yearn for the day when my heart starts beating and my presence ceases to leave scars upon the world's sensuous skin. They treated me as the false shepherd, and have performed numerous rituals to seal me within the silver you see before you. A constant testament to the ultimate betrayal I had committed. There I laid, and survived, for what I now know to be centuries. I had defiled God's plan for the world. And yet when I attempt to remove myself as a hindrance, the Almighty Father refuses to let me. Researcher Crisp nods grasping a necklace of the Christian cross in his hand. He lets go and resumes. Has there been an instance where an individual has been able to successfully use your anomalous abilities for selfless purposes? People have attempted, but greed always clouds their mind. They attempt to wish to feed their family, only for other starving peasants to kill them for their newly acquired boon. One man attempted to use me to wish away a screaming demon, only to become one himself. Another attempted to overthrow a tyrant, only to lose his head amidst the chaos. No matter the intentions, even when I was still known as Judas of Karioth, I knew that my miracles were false, an imitation of the man who died for our sins. Do you wish to die, RPC-394? I yearn for eternal silence, yes. There have been those, even within the mountain, that attempted to grant me mercy, but as they approach, their intent only increases my own effects. I am powerless to end my own life, and those who attempt for me are powerless against their own greed. Perhaps one day we will find a way to end your life. Perhaps, if one's own will was truly great enough to shatter my silver cell and cease the beating of my heart, they would deserve an audience with God himself. I still remember the words I heard when attempting to take my own life within Alkadama. 
Your life shall not end here, man of Iscariot. Your heart shall match with the earth's. When your blood is brought to the vessel of worlds, and the eyes of waves yet to come are brought together, only then will your curse become a blessing, and it will bring judgment. The meaning of these words are still lost on me, but if I cannot leave the world of the living, I wish to be as uninvolved as I can, so that my curse cannot be a detriment anymore. The land Jesus Christ was crucified in. Researcher Chris begins to physically strain from the effects of RPC-394-2. Your time is up, Chris. Researcher Chris stares briefly at… I apologize for the sudden decision to end the interview. Your cooperation is, erm, um, greatly appreciated. But I must end this conversation. If you would like, I do not mind returning to discuss things further. I, I, uh, I imagine you are quite lonely. I would appreciate that, my friend. The crypt men saw me only as the icon of sin that I am. But perhaps continued discussions may assist one another. May God's grace find you in the darkest of times, Sir Chris. End Log 11.41 AM Eastern Standard Time Closing Statement It is currently believed that RPC-394 may be connected to other anomalous objects and or entities. As of February 16, 2020, Researcher Chris has been the only person authorized to conduct interviews with RPC-394. It is also possible that RPC-394 possess the ability to lie, as it contradicts itself by saying, I have not the ability to peer further into your mind, yet was able to determine the era it was imprisoned within Mount Vesuvius by potentially accessing the information within Researcher Chris's mind. More interviews and testing of RPC-394 are planned, and have been approved by Level 4 or higher researchers. However, a psychiatric evaluation of Researcher Crisp and anyone else to be in contact with RPC-394 is to be conducted after every interaction, to ensure that RPC-394-2 has not left any permanent effects on their psyche.